Welcome back to our study on 1 Peter. And we're in the last chapter now, chapter 5, and going to give instructions to the leaders of the churches, basically, and how to function, as well as other members of the churches. To the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder, a witness of Christ's sufferings, and one who also will share in the glory to be revealed. So Peter has functioned as an elder in terms of oversight of churches, acting as a shepherd, and he's also one of the original 12 disciples who witnessed the sufferings of Christ. So he's now appealing with all the authority that he has to say, listen, I'm going to give you instructions on how to look after God's people. He says, be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, serving as overseers. So the image of a shepherd is always very meaningful when you understand Psalm 23 and Jesus teaching in John 10 of how the good shepherd looks after the sheep and takes them in green pastures and looks, nurtures them, feeds them, protects them, and uh, in Jesus' words, uh, lays down his life for them. And so basically here Peter is saying, be shepherds of God's flock. He's put people under your care. It's no little thing to be responsible for the spiritual welfare of others. Look after those that God has entrusted to your care. Your oversight, overseers, you're looking at how things are operating, not doing it all yourself, you're overseeing the work. Not because you must, no one ever should go into ministry because they must, but because you're willing. We should love to go into ministry and eldership and serve in God's church, as God wants you to be not greedy for money, but eager to serve. So an elder ultimately, although he might be a senior member in the church, his heart or her heart must be for service. Not lording it over those entrusted to you, but being examples of the flock. Always got to be aware of the dangers of thinking, well, I'm because I'm in this position, I, I, I'm in an authority position and I can lord it over those. He says, no, you're serving others just as Christ did us. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will never fade away. He's talking about when Jesus returns. If you do your job properly, you will receive a crown of glory. So that's the promise You've got a responsibility as leaders in churches, whatever position you have, whatever ministry you convene, serve others and do it willingly for the Lord's sake and God will reward you. Then he carries on, young men in the same way, be submissive to those who are older. All of you clothe yourselves with humility towards one another because God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble. He carries on, humble yourselves therefore under God's mighty hand and he may lift you up in due time. So the challenge is humility to the younger people to submit to those in authority. And humility is hard. It's placing myself under someone else's authority. We've looked at the authority structures in Scripture in terms of uh, governments, in terms of husbands and wives, in terms of masters and slaves. There's authority figures that God has set up. Humility means I submit to those in authority over me. Young men, humble yourselves before the leaders in the church, the older men, and God will lift you up, we told. It's a beautiful verse, a memory verse. Humble yourselves and he will lift you up. It used to be an old chorus that we used to sing. And then he changes slightly. Cast your anxiety on him because he cares for you. So he changes tack here now and he basically is saying, those of you anxious, who worried, who have concerns, bring them before Jesus. He is the one who says, come to me, all you who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest for yourselves. So that's the invitation to bring our burdens before Christ. We're not made to carry them, cast them onto Jesus. He died for them, allow him to take them on himself. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's obviously talking about persecution, I think, as opposed to temptation or deception, although those are always part of Satan's armory. But persecution was rife at this time. And so he says, be alert, be self-controlled. Satan is there ready to attack as soon as you uh, open the gate. So keep the gates closed, keep your mind pure, keep reading the word and be alert because persecution might be forthcoming. 
Resist him, standing firm in the faith, because you know that your brothers throughout the world are undergoing the same kind of suffering. So resist the temptation to give up. Resist the temptation to follow false teachings. Resist the temptation to start imbibing the world values systems. Stand fast. Stand fast. Your brothers and sisters in Christ are suffering around the globe. You too must be prepared to suffer for the kingdom. And then this is towards the end. Now, and the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ after you've suffered a little while will himself restore you and make you strong, firm, and steadfast. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. That's a benediction again. Basically, he's saying, you might go through a tough time, but it's okay. God will restore you back to your position, as he did with Job. And even if we go and suffer unto death, he will restore us into his kingdom to everlasting life and the joy that he set before us. And the final greetings, he adds, with the help of Silas, whom I regard as a faithful brother, I've written to you briefly, encouraging you and testifying that this is the true grace of God. Stand fast in it. So Silas has obviously helped him write the letter or given him information about the churches. So he says, Silas has helped me, and I've tried to encourage you and testify about what Christ has done. Stand fast. And then he says, she who is in Babylon, chosen together with you, sends you her greetings, and so does my son Mark. Now, there was no Babylon in existence at the time when Peter wrote. This must be a symbolic name for Rome, and you see the same in the book of Revelation. So the churches in Babylon send you their greetings, and so does my son Mark. Okay, so John Mark, who wrote Mark's gospel, is uh, with him, and uh, it, that's why it is thought that the gospel of Mark was basically dictated or told to Mark so he could write down what Peter knew and what Peter had seen. Mark wasn't a first-generation disciple of Jesus. Greet one another with a kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. So that's the end of Peter's first letter to the churches. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in some way you make us leaders in our families, over our children. You place us as leaders at schools, maybe, or at universities, in our employment, and the church. In one way or another, Lord, we all have a gift of leadership to lead others and be examples to others. Help us to be diligent, serve you willingly, because we know that actually you will one day reward us when you return to gather your church. So bless us as we do that. Help us to stand firm and resist Satan when there is persecution and when there's temptation and deception that we would resist him so he would flee from us. And lastly, Lord, help us when we struggle to cast our burdens onto you and not try and hold them ourselves. We really know that, uh, Lord, you died for those things, so we give them to you even now. Thank you, Jesus, for your word in this letter that we've gone through. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. God bless you. We'll see you tomorrow with another letter from Peter, his second letter.